What's up, YouTubers? This video has kind of been a long time coming, and it's not a topic that I kind of really wanted to ever do. I know that sounds ridiculous, but talking about safety, which is a very important thing that, I mean, everyone should be concerned about, especially your own personal safety. It's just, it's difficult to talk about because to talk about safety with welding, you kind of have to admit that it's a pretty unsafe thing that we do, that I do, that a lot of you guys do. I mean, let's face the facts. Welding creates fume, the lowest being TIG, the most being probably flux core wire, big thick wire on heavy plate, but all of it has fume. All of it, <laughs> welding, you have to have grinders. So you have grinding dust, some of the materials you weld or you just work around are hazardous to your health. Some of them are even radioactive, believe it or not. And doing this video, it's going to be kind of hard for me because I have to admit that a lot of the stuff that I do personally isn't the greatest for my health and that I probably don't take as many safety precautions as I should be. And that's a hard thing to admit, but part of being safe is admitting that you're not safe and that there's room for improvement. And one of the hardest things in the world to do is to not be a hypocrite. Like it's easy for anyone, myself included, to sit up here and tell you everything that you need to do. And then here I am on the flip side, not doing any of them. So like I said, it's very hard not to be a hypocrite. I don't like being a hypocrite. So doing this video and talking about all the right things to do means that I probably should start doing them more, which is going to be tough, but I think I can commit to that as should all of you out there. You should commit to becoming educated about safety, especially with welding related stuff, and you should commit to actually keeping up on it and being safe. So with that said, this video is going to be about safety and I'm going to try and give you as much honest ideas, opinions, and facts as I can and blow the dust off of what welding and just even general industry, things you should be doing and what you're exposed to. And trust me, I've been around industry long enough. I know all about being exposed to stuff that you really shouldn't be. So with that said, let's get into it and see where this rabbit hole goes. So like I said earlier, talking about safety is going to be kind of difficult for me because honestly, I'm not the safest uh, guy in the shop per se. And I definitely have room for improvement. There's no doubt about that. But you can learn with me here as I cover these common tools that injure pretty much all of us. I mean, all of us have been injured by one of these at some point. And if you haven't, then you probably don't do anything. So considering most of you guys do stuff, I'm sure that you have been injured. So to start out with something real simple, and I'm not going to make this video like some dumb safety video, so you'll have to bear with me a little bit through this. The most common thing to injure someone, a simple knife, a box cutter, something like that, very easy to nick yourself or have a more serious cut. Now, I, I haven't actually injured myself with that by accident at all, but a box cutter, I mean, sure, it's happened. It's pretty easy. You know, just pay attention. Hammers. If I told you the stories about what this has done <laughs> to my hand, my left hand, I actually wound up in uh, urgent care because of this and thought I broke or ripped my tendon off my knuckle on this hand thanks to that guy. I don't remember what I was doing. I was just getting mad, hammer on something, and I missed, like a complete idiot, hit my knuckle here. And actually, to this day, I still have a divot where it's like there's tendon or muscle missing here. You know, stuff happens. Could that have been avoided? Yeah, if I would have taken my time and just stepped away from it and not been as frustrated, but, you know, things happen. These three tools here, Sawzall, I've never really been injured by one of these. Maybe you have. I find that they're reasonably safe. This guy right here, there's no doubt that anyone who works around metal has been injured by one of these before. Angle grinder. And even with that said, you can see I don't have the guard on here. 
Now, I'm not going to make excuses. I mean, the reality is, is that this should. I can tell you that you're going to see in my videos that this particular tool and this tool only is the only angle grinder that I run without a guard. And that's simply because the RPM it operates and the power it has is pretty limited compared to any other angle grinder I have. And I'm not saying it's safe, but for what I use it for, kickback and breaking of discs is pretty much a minimal risk with this. Now, my corded grinders, all of those have guards on them. You'll never see me use one of those without a guard. They simply have too much power and too much RPM to where a disc, all it takes is for a disc like this to shatter and it can wind up blinding you. Again, not to say that this couldn't, but this, for what I use it for, I feel personally that it's safe and I always wear a face mask, welding hood, and safety glasses when I'm using this anyways. So the risk to me is pretty minimal. But anything, you know, more powerful than this, definitely use the guard. When this thing comes apart, it'll save you. And to further kind of bring this home, now these things, I don't know, are like six months old or something. And you can see quite a number of tears in them. Now, a lot of that isn't from getting cut. It's just from general use. Like when you wear these and you're sanding something on, I have a uh, belt sander and a small little rotary wheel for sharpening tungsten. Very easy to sand through part of this. But are these enough safety to, <laughs> when you're using grinders? Not really, I mean, look how thin this is. If you're using an angle grinder and don't want to cut your fingers or at least have a little bit more leeway, using stuff like this is very helpful. It will protect you a little bit, but the number one thing that you can do to protect yourself is use your head. You know, if you're using one of these things, check which way it spins. So this spins clockwise, okay? When you grind with this or cut with it, if you cut to where the wheel is hitting and it's pulling it away, that's much smarter than if you reverse this and it's going to push it towards you. If you sit here like this, and I'm going to keep my finger off the trigger here with your hands here, and you're trying to do it, cut something like this and it catches, boom, just cut your fingers. So always be mindful of the, the direction your tools turn and always throw your sparks away from your body or if you're cutting to where if it kickbacks, it kicks away from you, not towards you. This thing here, and not this particular grinder, but a corded one, is probably responsible for more injuries than anything else in a welding shop. You know, it's so easy that you're, say, cutting pipe overhead and you're cutting it on here, it catches and then kicks it back right in your face. Like this is just like that, boom, right in your face splits your head wide open. You know, you always want to position yourself to where the tool will hopefully catch and move away from you. And that's another thing. I'm, I'm a big fan of Metabo's. Now this is a Milwaukee, but Metabo has corded grinders with a clutch in it to where if the disc catches, the clutch slips and it doesn't kick back. It works better than I would have ever thought. Get one of those. Trust me, it'll save you. These little angle grinders here, I find that, especially with a carbide burr, the carbide can strip off of the burr and wind up all over everything and you put your hand on it and then it embeds in your skin, not to mention very common to throw stuff in your eyes if you're not wearing proper face or eye protection. So again, these are just some tools. Be smart with stuff. Don't keep your hands anywhere near where they could get cut by it. Hold on to them with two hands if possible. Again, I'm a hypocrite. I'll fully admit that. I don't have the handle on this grinder. If you're out there using something more powerful than this, especially a six or seven or nine inch grinder, you're an idiot if you don't use a handle. They have so much power, it could catch and throw it right into your leg. And I'm not trying to scare you guys. I'm just trying to tell you there's genuine risks with this stuff. So be smart about it. Now let's move on to the next topic. So you're probably asking yourself, why is this on the table? And that's a great question. 
I want to share something with you that I didn't really pay attention to and I probably still won't going forward, honestly, and I'm sure none of you guys will. But take a look at this can once. It's like if you remove this graphic here, look at this label, and you actually look at what's on this. Literally, this whole thing here is a warning that is talking about respiratory and body harm that this product can cause you. And then when you look down here, literally, different things you shouldn't do, warnings in all sorts of languages. Now, I get it. You know, there's an overabundance of lawyers and people that are so happy, but... If you were to just look at this not knowing anything about this, you would think like, my God, is this something you really want to be exposed to? And that's the interesting thing because this is just a standard 6010 5T plus rod and almost all welding rods and welding materials in general have warnings like this. And it's important to talk about what they're talking about. Now, this warning in a nutshell talks about how the welding fumes that you may be exposed to by welding with this can cause all sorts of health-related issues. And not just like little stuff like, oh man, I got <laughs> tennis elbow or something. It's more like, hey, guess what? You're going to die, buddy, at 50 years old of lung cancer. Like this is serious stuff. And that's why it's kind of hard for me to do this video because I can tell you that I've burned more than my fair share of rods and filler materials up without wearing respiratory protection. And that's something that you should really consider going forward from today on is looking into doing stuff to protect your lungs. And as part of this, I'm going to share a quick story. So my father, who was a great man, I didn't get to know him as well as I probably wished I would have. He worked in general construction for almost all of his life. He did bricklaying, he did masonry, he did just carpentry, finished carpentry, you name it. And being that he was quite a bit older than me, he worked in times when PPE was a joke on job sites. I mean, there was none. I mean, it was just expected you're gonna mix bags of mortar all day without respiratory protection. Not to mention everybody back in his day smoked. And quite a lot of you probably smoked too, which isn't good, but I'm not here to tell you otherwise. So he basically is an accumulation of smoking and exposure to industry-related carcinogens. Ended up dying of lung cancer at 62 years of age. And that in itself is kind of unfortunate, but... Almost every male in my family history has died at a young age. Any of us that worked in industry basically didn't make it to mid-60s. All died of lung cancer or complications of lung cancer. So it's one of those things where looking at this label might not mean anything to you today, but by looking at this kind of stuff as a trivial thing, guess what? If you are overexposed to the chemicals and elements that are in these things, and it's not just stick welding, it's welding in general, over 20, 30 years, it might take 5, 10 years off of your life. It's hard to say. You know, everybody's different. But if you can do something to mitigate that risk, why wouldn't you? And you can't really put a price on your health. Like, I love welding. And I wish I could do it for a full-time job. I like it that much, but I know the health risks regarding it, which is why I choose not to. But it's one of those things that you need to be smart about it. Doesn't matter if you're stick welding, you're TIG welding, any of that. You know, you're going to be exposed to chromium, hexavalent chromium, very well-known carcinogen. If you're grinding tungsten for TIG welding, you're exposed to possibly radioactive elements. I mean, all this stuff with welding, like I'm, I'm hopefully not busting anyone's bubble or, or making it seem like it's worse than it really is, but literally everything to do with metalworking is terrible for your lungs and 
when it gets into your lungs, it gets in your body. So it's terrible for your body as well. So wear PPE and I'm going to show you some things that you can buy some expensive, some cheap and affordable that can protect you when you're welding. So besides physical injury on the job, be it a welder or just working general industry, your number one risk from, you know, preventing you from going home in one piece or alive is going to be, you know, getting injured like a pinch point or getting your hand sheared off or falling in a vat of molten iron, whatever. That's like an immediate danger, which to avoid those, you need to be smart and watch out and use tools and devices, safety, etc. You get the picture on that. But what you don't see on the everyday thing is what they call an accumulation toxin, or well, I call it that. And that's exposure, long-term exposure to certain things accumulate in your body and then cause things like cancer. Welding is one of the worst when it comes to long-term exposure because you're exposed to elements like chromium, well, hexavalent chromium, uh, magnesium, even aluminum dust, grinding dust. All of that stuff accumulates in your lungs. Now, your lungs might be better genetically than mine. I know mine aren't really the best, but lungs can only handle so much crap in them before they can no longer like self heal certain certain stuff like asbestos and hexavalent chromium cause damage that 20 years down the road is still not repaired so you have to prevent that stuff from getting in your lungs to begin with now i have a test that i want you guys to do and i already know you know the answer to what I'm going to tell you to do. You already know it. But if you go on lunch break at your work and you blow your nose and that rag is full of black boogers, if you see those boogers on that <laughs> napkin, let's be honest, that's in your lungs, isn't it? Well, guess what? If that stuff's in your lungs, what do you think that's going to do in 10 to 20 years from now? It's not going to be good. I don't have kids, well, I'm sure a lot of you guys do. Trust me, knocking 5, 10, 15 years of your life off for just you know not wearing PPE respiratory protection, it's not worth it, man. Trust me on that. So I'm going to show you some stuff that will protect your lungs. So let's start out with the easy stuff. These little round filters go on a mask. These may or may not be rated for what you're looking at filtering out of the air. And that's something that if you go on 3M's site or any kind of filter manufacturer site or search uh, OSHA standards for filters, you can, there's all sorts of stuff out there to where you can enter what the risk for chemical, be it you know an actual liquid, an aerosol, particulate, grinding dust, whatever it is, and they can specify what filter you need to protect you against that. So like a simple filter, dust filter like this, and this might be a little bit better than a dust filter. It is a P100. This may or may not fil filter out welding fume from hitting your lungs. But you can find out simply by searching for this part number or a welding mask that you're looking at buying and making sure. This here which the filters are pretty dirty and I should replace it is made by Miller. It's a face mask. I believe this is a higher standard than what these are, but this is rated for grinding dust and welding fume. Something like this, I think these sell for maybe under 50 bucks. I know these aren't the most comfortable things to wear. Trust me on that. I've you know, I, I've worked many a hot job site where the last thing in the world you want to do is put this on there. But if you wear this every day that you're welding and grinding on stuff, this might add 10 years to your life. I'm not exaggerating. This little thing here. And they're affordable. Which brings up another good point. If you're working for someone 
and they're exposing you to anything from silica dust on a construction site to welding on stainless steel and you're eating hexavalent chromium all day, you should definitely look into, if they're not providing you PPE and you request it, you should consider filing a complaint with OSHA. And I know a lot of you guys think, you know, that OSHA, oh, it's just the government, they're going to come in and just cause problems. But here's the reality, and I'm going to share another story with you. A friend of mine, and this is, I'm not exaggerating about this, worked for a chemical barrel cleaning company. So if you can think of chemical drums. And they did other type of chemical containers. Well, he got a job there. And they literally, the, the long story short is, they literally had this guy cleaning, cleaning chemical containers, any random chemical container you can imagine that would come into a shop and clean out what the residue that was left, like the last quarter inch in the container, with a shop vac. So not only did he have no training on what he was doing, he had no idea what was in the chemical containers. Many of them weren't even labeled. There was no bill of lading half the time for what came into this, his work. And occasionally the shop vac would literally melt through the bottom from chemical reactions. And to make it even worse, they would saw cut some of these chemical containers on a big giant band saw and whatever was in them would just leach out onto a stainless steel table and drip into a 55 gallon drum at the corner. And occasionally it would start smoking and fill this whole place up with smoke and then they would evacuate the employees across the street and then once the smoke dissipated, the boss would say, all right, get your ass back in there. I'm not, I'm literally not exaggerating this. I heard about this and this is not maybe five, six years ago, seven years ago. My friend told me this is what was going on. And it was so unbelievable that I, I couldn't just sit around and not do anything about it. And I worked with him to talk with OSHA. And they had a huge investigation that literally got so big that state representatives got involved in it. And it sounds ridiculous, but there's companies out there that give so little of a shit about your health that that kind of stuff can happen in America, even with OSHA. And you have to take your health serious. And if some employer's doing that, you know what? Your health is worth, worth more than, than anything else. Trust me on that. So if your employer isn't providing you the proper stuff you need, contact OSHA. It's, you're, you're, you're not being a wuss for doing it. I mean, when you're dying of lung cancer due to hexavalent chromium exposure when you're 50, your employer is going to be laughing all the way to the bank because they don't care. And I'm not saying that about, like, trust me, a lot of employers do care about their people and they don't want to hurt anyone. I'm just saying, like, it's so easy to be negligent at every level. And that's why safety is your own personal responsibility. You know, speak up about it. You know, there's tons of laws, like, even if they try and come back and find out that you reported them and they try and, like, uh, what's the term? Fire you or take disciplinary action for doing that. Like, there's laws that will protect you. You know, it's always better. And you got to think not just for yourself today, but the people in the future at that company that they're going to hurt and poison, etc. Like, it's, it's worth it. So anyways, with that said, that's the more simple, cheaper stuff. Your employer must provide that for you. And if you're in your home shop, pick up something like this. Wear it. And again, I'm a hypocrite. I don't wear it in my videos. It's kind of hard to talk and instruct while I have something like that on, okay? But I still actually do use that, especially with welding and buffing stainless steel. So let's talk about the most expensive option. A lot of you guys will not probably have experience with using these. 
and that's because, well, they cost two to three thousand dollars depending on which unit and options. I mean, this one's probably sixteen hundred or in that ballpark. As a home gamer, unless you're independently wealthy, something like this can seem like a massive expense, especially because your welder probably didn't even cost this much. So why would you use this? This is set up for more of a person who does production welding. Arguably, it does offer far better protection than just a simple mask. I will tell you it's far more comfortable than a simple mask because it provides cool air. And all this really does is this is a filter pack. It pulls air through a filter into the hood through a, there's a tube that hooks it up and then it blows it in your face to where it's actually very comfortable to use this. But this, if you're doing welding all day for a production shop, they should be providing you something like this because this won't necessarily filter all of that, especially you got to remember this is on your face. And if all the smoke is going on your face, this is going to clog up pretty quickly. This sits near your belt line and it's pulling fresh air from behind you. So it's going to stay cleaner for a lot longer and the filter and this is gigantic too. But I'll show you a little bit more. This works just like a normal welding hood. It has a chin, not a strap, but it's like a sock that fits over your chin. And then it has this that goes over your head. The nice thing is this actually seals outside light from obscuring your vision. So I find that it's actually very easy to weld with this. This also has a built-in grinding shield which this one's a little bit worse for wear. I got to swap that out. But you can flip this up, do your grinding, and then flip down and do your welding. If you're doing enough welding to where this isn't cutting it anymore, your employer or you should look at getting one of these. It's going to protect your lungs. Like, I'll be honest, like, I don't know what damage I've done to my lungs. I do go to the doctor occasionally. Last time I was there, which unfortunately was about three years ago, they said I was pretty healthy, but who knows, you know, a lot of things can change. I really wish that I would have been wearing something like this or this 20 years ago, you know, but it's no excuse to say, well, I didn't for 20 years, so I'm not anymore. Like even a couple years of wearing this, might make a difference for your longevity. All right, so let's move on to the next topic. So we already talked about the importance of safety glasses, which you should be wearing them. And I'll admit, I don't always wear them. And you know what? I'm going to make a point to wear them. You have my word on that. Even though you can't see me when I'm in videos, I will have safety glasses on any time I'm doing anything in my shop from now on. You have my word. Earplugs. I virtually never wear them. I mean, granted, I do wear hats that cover my ear canal, which do lower the volume level in there and probably somewhat has helped prevent ear damage or hearing, hearing damage over the years for me, but still it's no excuse. These things are kind of awesome because not only do they muffle everything so you don't have to hear people nagging you or your boss yelling at you, but they keep crap from getting in your ear canal. And I don't know if you've ever had a hot BB or a piece of slag or something go in your ear canal, but my God, it sucks. It's terrible, especially when it gets a blister in there. Like, I, I man, I don't even want to give you a story on that one. It's not even worth it. You'll probably end the video right then and there. It's so, so bad. So anyways, I did have a hearing test recently. It came back uh, apparently very good for my age, which honestly I was shocked because I never wore hearing protection. But it's something that I'm going to do from now on. You have my word on it as well. I'm going to be smart about it. Like it doesn't take too much, you know, loud noises repetitive over years before you start suffering hearing loss. I mean, hearing loss is... A natural part of getting older for all of us it will be but do you really want to be wearing hearing aids at 35 or 40 no trust me you don't I worked with uh, a guy in this maintenance department a number of years ago and the guy he's probably I don't know he's probably late 50s at the time 
he's one of those guys that refused to get a hearing aid, and he was literally so deaf, you could climb down stairs behind him and say, hey, and then shout his name, and he would walk, just he didn't hear you. You could talk to him, and you could tell when he couldn't hear you because he would just nod his head kind of like an idiot, no offense, because he's actually a great guy, but he'd just sit there like clueless, and it's like, at that point, you know you have to get a hearing aid, but at the same point, like, do you really want to be 40, 45 years old with that bad a hearing to where you can't, like, even communicate with people? For something literally 10 cents shoved in your ear will protect you? Be smart about it. It's not, you know, it's a good thing to have. Another thing I'm going to mention here, this is a welding coat, and I, I, you've seen me wear this occasionally, and I also wear these cotton car hearts, which they don't tend to catch fire and they do protect against UV, but it pays to have proper clothing. You know, I generally weld in jeans and like I said, a car heart and I have leather steel toe boots. Those protect me pretty good, but it is worth mentioning. I've seen so many videos on the internet and I'm not going to name names. And you probably do it all the time too. And I'm not gonna, I'm, this isn't, I'm not making fun of you guys out there, okay? I'm just being honest. But I, out of all the unsafe bullshit I do, one thing I don't do is like weld with short sleeve shirts, like especially TIG welding. Now, maybe it's because of my pale complexion. But if I don't button up my shirt, like this thing all the way up, turtleneck it up here, within like two hours of stick welding on and off, and not just straight, just on and off, my neck will be red and I'll have a light sunburn. I don't know how you guys out there, especially people of a fair complexion like me, you know, that maybe you don't burn as easy as I do, but you no sleeve, short sleeve, Sometimes not even gloves, TIG welding. Like, I don't know, that just seems idiotic. And again, I'm not making fun of people when I say that, but like, that's about the fastest way to almost guarantee skin cancer that I can think of. I mean, if I'm personally getting sunburned within like a half an hour of TIG welding on my neck just because I didn't cover it good enough, I don't know how you guys are spending hours a day with no gloves, no sleeves, just welding away, like, you're going to get melanoma. Don't do that. Like, wearing a Carhartt hoodie or something like this or something, just cover your skin. Seriously. I'm not joking. Like, it's not cool. Like, you'll see me run no grinder on, no guard on my Milwaukee grinder, and I don't make that into a big deal, but you'll never see me, you know, not covered up at least halfway decent, especially no gloves, like you're out of your mind. It's not worth the skin cancer, guys. Wear, wear, wear something, cover that skin up. Again, I wanna see you guys, if you wanna have kids or have kids, that you see your grand grandbabies. Like, be smart about it. All right, let's talk about the next thing. Now, I'm not just sitting back here sleeping like a city worker, I'm showing you boots you got to buy yourself a decent pair of work boots and they got to be steel toe. Now I'll admit I'm more of a worker bee per se that I don't even own a pair of tennis shoes, but I don't really go for runs or anything anymore. But I literally, the only pair of boots I have that aren't steel toe are some super insulated winter boots. That's it. Otherwise all I have is steel toes of assorted sizes. You gotta get some steel toe boots. I these things have saved me from so many toe injuries. You have no idea. And if you're working in a metal shop, you'll probably get metatarsal metatarsal guards. Man, I can't even pronounce it. Um, basically, a piece of metal with leather on it that covers this, so that if something hits here, you don't break uh, the top of your foot. But these that I wear, I'm a big fan of Thorogood leather boots. These particular ones are made here in Wisconsin, about three hours north of where I live. And I have very big boot size, 14, so very few companies make them. Red Wing doesn't even make the, this style and that'll fit me, unfortunately. 
but I buy thorough goods for most of my boots. I've been pretty happy. But get yourself a nice pair of steel toe boots. Screw them tennis shoes. You don't want to be wearing those in a shop, even your home shop. Like tennis shoes aren't, <laughs> no. <laughs> get yourself a good, comfortable pair of boots. Not to mention a good pair of boots. I'm telling you, if I use cheap like shoes or something else, like I bought in Walmart boots and after like two months, they're either worn out or like I'm starting to get hip pain and knee pain, all the great things that come when you get, when you're aged like fine wine and guess what? Your boots make a difference. Like anytime I buy cheap boots, I tend to get, wake up with a lot more pain. I switch back to something decent like these, which they're, they are expensive, but I start feeling better. All right, let's go onward. So I got in front of us here, two of the most common chemicals that you'll probably find in your home shop or in your shop, whatever have you that you work at, acetone and brake cleaner. The reason I picked these two is, well, because we all have them and they're around us all the time. And two, because they're actually extremely dangerous and you might not have realized that. So acetone in itself, well, it's highly flammable. I can tell you that I left the lid open on this, well, not this can, but a while ago on a can, and I was cutting with a torch, saw sparks literally fly over the top of this and realized that A, this was on the floor because I was an idiot, and B, the cap wasn't even on it. And it kind of had an eerie feeling like, my God, had a spark hit anywhere near the mouth of this, this probably would have completely engulfed my shop and myself in flames. Like, not good. So keep the cap on this, but that's besides the point. Acetone, from what I've read, absorbs through your skin fairly readily and can poison you and is not really good to be exposed to. Not to mention the vapors. It vaporizes so fast that you're breathing in acetone. So I started a while ago wearing gloves and I try to do that pretty often as I wear gloves when I'm wiping metal down or I try and be smart about it. So you should be as well. Now let me move this out of the way. This stuff can turn you into a vegetable, literally. Now, this says non-chlorinated, but if you ever use chlorinated brake cleaner and say you clean some metal like this, just hose it down and clean it off, wipe it, and then you go and weld on it, you can create a poisonous gas from the chlorine being exposed to the super high temperature of the arc and it will literally turn you into a vegetable. I've heard and read of numerous accounts of people in their home shop using chlorinated brake cleaner, spraying something down, and at the minimum, I am not exaggerating, the minimum, suffering long-term serious lung damage, and at the worst case, suffering catastrophic brain damage to the point that they're literally a vegetable. So all I can say is, is that never ever use chlorinated brake cleaner to clean anything that you're gonna be welding on. And honestly, my opinion is, is that I don't use brake cleaner at all to clean anything I'm welding on. What's to say, I mean, chlorinated brake cleaner has kind of like a chlorine smell to it. So generally you'll know it, but it's just to me, like who knows what's in here? Some of these are just acetone like that aerosol so that's that's all right like that isn't going to necessarily kill you but <laughs> what's to say they didn't put a little bit of chlorine in here who knows it's not worth the risk which brings up another great point any cleaner that you use to clean something and then weld on it you better be sure as to what's in it because you're going to vaporize or aerosol it in the arc and if you breathe that in it could kill you, you know, be smart about it. And that's the filters I showed you like that mask, that may not remove a particular chemical like, you know, the chlorine that's in the air that you're cooking off, that may not remove that. So not even the mask might not even protect you from that. So anytime you're dealing with any chemicals, be very careful with it and don't 
have your face anywhere near them when you're using them. And then if you're going to weld on them, be sure that they're not chlorine containing or any number of other chemicals. I mean, not to say that half the stuff in your shop, be it spray paint or whatever, is bad for you anyways and probably causes cancer. But you definitely don't want to be welding on any of those. And brings up another point I just thought of. There's all sorts of stuff out there like weld through primer. I don't use that stuff. To me, you better be wearing a mask. I mean, come on, it's paint and you spray a weld like you set up a fillet weld or auto body, very common in auto body, and you just sit there on a lap weld and you put spray through primer and you just weld it with your face right in there. Like that's gonna cause, <laughs> if that doesn't cause cancer, then I don't know what to say. Like, that would be a shock. Like, don't put your face in it. All right, onward. Speaking of not putting your face in something, I got a standard welding hood here. This is a Viking 3350. Great hood, by the way. I see guys all the time, especially people, when I teach them how to weld. I'm guilty of it, too. My eyesight isn't what it once was, but... They'll weld on something like this, and their face is literally like this close to it, okay? As you're breathing, and as that welding fume comes, and it's going to come right up here, right into your nose, and you're going to be breathing all that welding fumes. Now, if you can't see this to where you need to be this close, then either you need glasses or you need a cheater lens that they have for almost every welding hood. It's just a low magnification that fits in here on the inside to where you can back up to where your face is like back here at least. I mean, that's a good foot distance or more right here. This is far better than right here. I mean, sometimes if your head's under the car and stuck between the exhaust and the frame, whatever, you know, you got to do what you got to do, but still, like, that's ridiculous. Keep your face out of the fume. It's also worth noting, all of these, this is an adjustable shade. I'll show you in here. So this is adjustable between, let me look, a shade 5 and a shade 13. So to put it on shade five, you gotta flip this lever up here and then it adjusts one scale and then when you flip it over, you're on the higher scale. My neighbor, who was a welder for a lot of his life, he made cranes for a number of companies and then kind of got out of that. He's 70 years old and his eyesight's pretty well shot. I mean, he's had uh, not glaucoma surgery, um, can't remember where your eyes get cloudy. You guys probably know, you're probably shouting it now. So he had surgery for his eyes to clear up, to remove this cloudiness, and now he can see better. But he talked about you know, all the welding he did and how much it affected his eyes and how he wished that he would have ran a darker shade. Now I've heard all sorts of accounts. I've heard old school welders say, oh man, I used a shade six for 40 years and I can still see. But then I hear guys say, man, I used a shade 11 and now my eyesight at 55 is shot. And the doctors are saying, had I used a darker shade, it would have been better. So where's the truth in it? I don't know. What I generally tell people when it comes to what shade you should pick, set it as dark as you can and you can still weld competently. The better you are at welding, the darker the shade you can use because you know what's going on by even a little glimmer of, of the molten pool. So I generally, for stick welding, use a shade 11 or 12, uh, sub 160, 70 amps. For TIG, I generally use a shade 12 or 13. Now this, the clarity of this is so good that I can have it really dark and still see. If you're using like a fixed shade hood, like a sugar scoop, a shade, you know, 13 or 12 might be flat out way too dark because you don't have the clarity. So you have to play with that a little bit. But if you can get away with a shade 12, I'd rather have less light coming through than more, if that makes sense. It's also worth noting that even when these things don't auto darken, 
They don't let through UV light from my understanding. So it still blocks the UV light. It's just that it's like staring at a bright light bulb. It's not pleasant. You can still get the little green floating balls after arc flashing yourself, but at least it blocked the UV so you don't get arc eye. Which that's another thing to talk about. Don't weld with the old squint and tack method or squint and weld like with your MIG or even stick. Wear, wear a damn hood, flip it down. Like the, the old, oh, I'm going to look away or I'm going to squint really hard. You know what? If you've ever had arc eye, you only need to have it one time in your life where it feels like you literally have sandpaper on your eyelids and your eyes were rubbed raw with sandpaper and every time you squint or close your eyes it's like sandpaper rubbing on sandpapered eyes if that makes any sense to you it's terrible i arc flashed myself when i was learning to tig weld for like one second and i my eyes are really close i forgot to flip down my hood i had a very mild version of arc eye for arc flash burn on the eyes and I'm telling you it sucked my eyes watered it felt it just terrible I've seen guys that will tack up like 30 tacks run a couple inches of weld and next thing you know they're out of work for a day and a half because their eyes are so shot so don't be stupid just wear wear a hood please just wear it all right onward so a couple things I want to talk about here. Anybody out there with your home workshop, you should have at least one, preferably two fire extinguishers handy. I mean, let's face it, we're melting metal and there's sparks. How easy would it be for something to go up in flames? So it pays to have a fire extinguisher. You also want one that's an ABC rated. I'm not going to discuss that in detail, but you want one with a rating to put out electrical fires as well as like combustible papers. Now there are special uh, fire extinguishers that are used for like metal fires. And by metal fires, I mean, there's certain metals like say potassium, I believe it is, that once it's lit on fire, it can't go out or like even a mixture of thermite. Well, if you're working in an industry that works around all sorts of metals that are very reactive to oxygen or water, a lot of them are reactive to water, there's special fire extinguishers that are used in those circumstances. So if you're working around anything like that, you may want to have a special extinguisher, just like for grease fires, there's generally a special extinguisher for those. And if you use the wrong one, you can actually make the fire worse because you'll actually spread it. So depending on what you're working on, look up fire extinguisher classifications and then buy an extinguisher that meets your needs. Now this is a, I don't know, a pretty small one, all things considered. I mean, the ones at most industrial places are a lot bigger than this, but for my little shop, if this doesn't put it out, I probably don't want to be anywhere near it because I'm going to end up probably getting burned to death or asphyxiated but you need to have an extinguisher. Now I built this workshop that I'm in myself and I have 5 8 fire code drywall in this place and the ceiling's double layered, all the wiring's in conduit in here. I mean, and behind the walls, like you can't see it, but every wall in this shop, behind the 5 8 drywall and the framing in there and the fire blocking is actually solid, uh, brick and masonry over 16 inches thick. Now the ceiling above me has wood joists, but I have um, rock wool insulation in there. So if a fire ever broke out in here, it's it would take, I don't know, a day to burn through the, the drywall up top above us. And it's just, it's let's face it, for anything I do, a fire will never get out of this room. It's just not going to. But your own house shop, like in your garage or heaven forbid your basement, probably is nowhere near the fire resistance of my shop here. So you want to be smart about stuff. Now, I don't have a smoke detector in this room, but directly outside of this room in the hallways that surround this room, I have smoke detectors 
That way, if they go off, I can hopefully hear it, especially even if I'm outside and I know something is going on. If I had a, a smoke alarm in this room, it would go off all the time because any kind of welding would instantly set it off. Same thing, like it, it would pay, you know, if you have a detached garage, obviously putting a smoke alarm in there is just going to set off all the time. But make sure you have one in your house nearest that garage. And if it's attached, definitely. And have a couple fire extinguishers handy. You never know, like you don't want to use one of these. This guy I haven't used yet, and it's probably almost to the point that it needs to be recertified. But have one of these handy. It'll save you a ton of money and hassle and possibly even your life and your equipment. All right, so we got this one and then one more, and then I think I'm going to wrap this video up. I've been talking too much already. Now, you're probably wondering, what does the old wobbly pop or barley wine have to do with um, safety? And that's, you probably shouldn't be drinking these things and doing stuff like welding or working on your vehicles or whatever have you, working on your house, using nail guns. Now... I enjoy a good beer. I don't drink enough to where I even get remotely intoxicated virtually ever. And nowadays, being that I'm getting older, I just don't really drink much at all because I just get sick. You know, it's not worth it. I don't like losing one hour to having a headache. <laughs> it's just not worth it. When I was younger, uh, you could say that I partied a little bit, probably a little bit too much, but whatever. That's the past... Now's, now's the present. So I get it. You want to drink beer and you want to have a good time, but you shouldn't mix power tools, welding, etc., with beer. Nothing good comes out of it, and alcohol in general, okay, not just beer. <laughs> you whiskey drinkers and scotch drinkers, <laughs> you, you're not getting cut loose just yet on that. But seriously, though, I know that, you know, welding is all about drinking beer and and hookers and blow and all of that fun stuff but let's face it like if you want to drink beer wait till you're done with the job not during not before wait until you're done with it to where you can sit down you know be responsible about it like it's so easy like a grinder you can make a mistake and shoot the disc it can break off and it can take your eye out in an instant do you really want the probability of that going up tenfold because you're intoxicated the answer is no so keep it to the weekends or when you're not working all right let's go on so i got a bunch of random items here and it probably doesn't make sense but i just want to approach this as kind of like a teachable moment where i want you guys to start thinking about hazards that you might have around your workplace so the first thing, let's talk about this. This is just like canned grease. Do you really want this crap all over your hands? No. Could this be a long-term carcinogen if you're exposed to it either on the skin or breathing the fumes? Absolutely. So if you're going to be handling this, you probably should be wearing some gloves so that any of it that gets on you doesn't get on your skin and then you can just throw the gloves away. So it pays to have gloves. Now, I personally buy, I get coupons for Harbor Freights gloves like these. They seem to be pretty good other than I always buy the large and they're pretty small. I got big hands, so get some gloves that fit you and wear them. Like even with simple things like grease, wear the gloves, it'll save you. Now, this is just pipe dope or at least that's what we call it here in Wisconsin, but it's pipe thread sealant commonly used on gas pipe and I guess water pipe to any number of things. Well, this stuff here, I mean, is just a simple chemical that you could be exposed to and over time could also cause issues. So again, wear the gloves, don't breathe the fumes. I mean, this stuff doesn't really have much fumes, but you know, again, makes sense to protect yourself. This is a piece of metal that I cut off and it has paint on it. Now, if you're going to weld over some paint, what do you think is going to happen to that paint? Well, it's going to get cooked off, atomized, and you're going to breathe the fumes. Well, if breathing the fumes of the paint when it's wet 
and just spraying out of a can is bad. What do you think it is when you're welding on it and you get it so hot that it vaporizes and then goes into your lungs? It's probably even worse. So when you weld or clean or grind on scabby material like this, wear a respirator and a mask or something. You don't want it going in your lungs. Which brings up another point. This is a piece of steel, okay? Now I know it's steel because it has mill scale and a magnet sticks to it, okay? But do we or I even really know what this is made out of? The answer is no. This could have some kind of unknown cancer causing, um, not chemical, but alloying element. And I wouldn't know it. And one of the things I found over the years is that the quality of steel that you can get seems to be subpar now. And a lot of this stuff comes from China. And China seems to have a really bad habit of, unless you specify absolutely everything that can't be in whatever product you're buying from them, anything that's not specified as a no-go will wind up in there. So like... Unless you say, hey, no thorium in this, literally, it could have radioactive thorium in it. So I don't trust that a steel mill, especially for stuff like this from China, doesn't have stuff that you don't want. Now, normal steel dust isn't necessarily a carcinogen for lung cancer, at least it's not classified as such. But when you're talking stainless steel, the chromium, the hexavalent chromium exposure that causes lung cancer and can cause Parkinson's. But even normal steel can have molybdenum and any number of alloying elements in here that can cause Parkinson's or at least believed to cause Parkinson's and lung cancer. So even plain steel, you got to be safe and you got to be smart about it. Like you don't want the dust from this in your lungs. Which brings up another one. These are TIG welding tungstens. Now, I use 2% lanthanated in the shop here because I find it works better than 2% thoriated. And it's not radioactive. Now, you probably remember me saying something about radioactive dust. Well, I'm not exaggerating when I tell you this, but thoriated tungsten, which a lot of places still use to this day, actually has thorium in it, and when you grind it, it produces a radioactive dust. Now, what's worse than tungsten? I mean, tungsten in itself, if you get the dust in your lungs, can't be good, probably causes lung cancer. But now let's take tungsten, alloy it with thorium, and then add tungsten and radioactive thorium dust to your lungs. No go for me. That's one of the things that I will not use. I mean, to me, that crosses a line. That's like, hey, do you want you know, your, your dust with radioactivity or not. Well, if I have to choose, no radioactivity. Which brings up another point. Now, Midwest Tungsten Service seems to be a reputable company, and there are ways to check this, but what's to say you didn't buy some cheap tungsten straight from China and that it isn't thoriated to begin with, even though it's labeled as though it's not? You know, case in point, who really knows what's in this? We don't know. There's so much dealing with welding and just home shops and fabrication, all that. We have no idea what's in anything that's around us. Just like, you know, they put asbestos in literally everything. Ceiling tiles, floor tiles, drywall, <laughs> toilet seats, vault, like anything. A sink. I mean, it, it's amazing what they put it in. Nobody had any idea. Well, we knew it was bad, but they put it in everything. And when you renovate old houses, you don't really know. So it pays to either test things or just protect yourself. And this is a case of what this video is really about is we as home gamers and even you guys that work in shops and stuff, there's so many unknowns that playing the game of, oh, well, they said it's safe, so I'll do it, is not a winning game. That's You're going to only lose. That is a casino game that you pump your life savings into and you lose everything, which is why it's the most important thing is to just protect yourself. Be smart about it. Wear your PPE. Like, 
you no dust in your lungs is a good thing. Trust me on that. All right, let's go and finish this video up. So I know this was a long video and I probably droned on a little bit too long about stuff, but it's coming from a place of caring and I want to see you guys stay healthy well into old age. You know, if I'm at least a little bit smarter, especially going forward in my life, hopefully I can beat the record of the average male life expectancy in my family, which honestly is pretty terrible. And it's has a lot to do with smoking and combining all these other cancerous uh, chemicals, but that's besides the point. What I'm getting at is, is that we're all responsible for our own safety. You know, it pays to get educated. It pays to pay attention to things that you're exposed to. When you're at your work or your home shop, just look at what's around you. Look at what you're dealing with, like your, your spray paints, your chemicals. Like, just become educated. And when you're educated, make the right decisions to wear protective equipment to protect against those hazards. You know, this Miller face mask or something similar is probably the best money you can invest to protect the health of your lungs and pre hopefully prevent lung cancer if you're a welder or even a home fabricator. You know, this right here, $50. It might be a little bit more now, but could be 10 years on your life. You know, honestly, just by having that and protecting your lungs, you know, it pays to get good protective equipment. Buy the best stuff that you can afford. And if you're, you work for someone, make sure that they're buying you good, good PPE. And again, this video isn't meant to scare you. Like, I love welding, and you probably already know that, and I don't anticipate I'm ever going to stop. I mean... The last thing hopefully I do in my life is build something, whether or not it's by welding it together or building a house, whatever. I'm a builder, like I'm not gonna give that up no matter what, but you know, you can mitigate so much of the risk just by being smart and getting the proper PPE. So with that said, I hope that you guys learn something, maybe that you're going to change some of the stuff that you do for the better. I know that I made a commitment to wear earplugs and make sure I'm always wearing eye protection, um, as well as probably wearing the mask more often. I mean, it's hard to do and talk, obviously, but I'm going to make some commitments on being better. And hopefully you will to yourself as well. If you have any comments, questions, or would like to add stories or opinions on this, I gladly read them, and I think everyone can benefit from it. You know, We've all done dumb things and exposed ourselves to dangerous chemicals and whatever have you, and you know, as adults and even younger people, we owe it to ourselves and our kids to do the right thing and try and be smart about stuff and make sure that other people aren't being ignorant that said, thanks for sticking around. I appreciate you watching the whole video. Till next time.